We're here at the IIS meeting. We're here in Amsterdam with uh, Anthony Fauci, who is director of the NIH, uh, National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. We really appreciate you taking the time to visit with us again. Uh, we've visited over the years. The, ch the years have changed. They have. And yeah. the, 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 the subject is still HIV, but the problems are changed in so many ways. And I think uh, more than anything, I'd like to acknowledge the work that you've done in so far as uh, as an activist in a way, because you work with the people who are working hard at the issues that are all, uh, at the moment, important to us. And today, they've changed. So I think, give us a sense of where we were and where we're at without taking uh, the, the 20 hours it would really take. Right. To <laughs> yes, it would take 20 hours. Well, I mean, if you look at through the years that you've been interviewing me over such a long period of time, we went from very few tools uh, to counteract HIV from the standpoint of individual treatment and prevention to now over the years having a lot of very effective tools in the form of therapy. Therapy both uh, in the standpoint of combination therapy that we didn't have that can essentially drop the viral load to below detectable level to save the life not only the individual infected person but now with treatment as prevention to clearly have a situation where if you are undetectable you will not transmit the virus to your sexual partner mm -hmm. gets to the to the phrase that we're hearing a lot about mm -hmm. now is uh, undetectable equals untransmissible, which in fact the scientific data for that is is quite strong and keeps on improving and it right? keeps yeah. ge and it keeps getting better. Then also there's pre-exposure prophylaxis, which we know when utilized as directed is is extraordinarily effective in preventing acquisition of infection for those at risk. So if you look now in 2018. Where we are, there's almost the two worlds of HIV. There's the world for the individual patient who does, depending upon where he or she lives, have the accessibility to health care, to the availability of diagnosis, therapy, and follow-up care, that things are enormously better for that type of an individual now than it was when you interviewed me decade and two decades ago. Whereas on the other hand, we have the challenge of HIV AIDS as an epidemiological phenomenon, as a pandemic, because we've been talking about ending HIV. We've been hearing about that for a couple of years and we've made improvements in that. However, the situation is such that although we've set goals, the 90-90-90 goals, the turning around the trajectory of the epidemic, we have not been meeting those goals, even though we have made some improvement. And one of the problems is that when you're dealing with an infectious disease and you do not continue to diminish its dynamics, ultimately it will rebound and increase. And that's what we're concerned about, particularly with this concept that was called the youth bulge, and that as the years go by, there's gonna be relatively, proportionately speaking, a larger number of young people who are sexually active and at risk for HIV. So as time is not on our side, because as time goes by, there will be in the broad community a larger proportion of at-risk people. So unless we really aggressively turn the dynamics around, we're gonna have a problem. We already have a problem, it's gonna get worse. So that's what I meant by almost two different ways of looking at it. For the individual who has the capability and the accessibility and the fortune of being able to have good care versus the global community of HIV, mm -hmm. particularly in the developing world. So it's challenging, it's encouraging on the one hand, but it's very challenging on the other hand. Until we fax find a vaccine or a cure, we're going to have to work hard all the time at trying to diminish that number. Exactly, it's a constant struggle. You cannot let up. I mean, obviously, a vaccine is something that would be the ultimate nail in the coffin of the HIV as a pandemic. Uh, I don't think we're gonna need necessarily a 98% effective vaccine like we have for measles or polio or, or smallpox or yellow fever, but even a vaccine that's 50 to 60% effective, when you combine it with the now large number of modalities of prevention, ranging from treatment as prevention, circumcision, pre-exposure prophylaxis, we can turn around the, the, the trajectory of the epidemic, but we've got to continue to push very hard as prior to getting a vaccine. I mean, it's great if we have a vaccine, but we've got to continue to push because we don't have a vaccine. Right. As though we may never get one. It is conceivable yeah. we may not get yeah. one. It yeah. is conceivable. Yeah. 
the uh, the the other thing that we seem to uh, to uh, hate to lose is the people that have worked so hard at this disease, and we lost David Cooper, we lost uh, Mark Weinberg, and uh, Martin Delaney right. some number of years back, and uh, Joop Langa right from here in right. Amsterdam. It's it's um, we remember all those that uh, were working in the fight as, as activists who are living with the disease, right. but there's a number of people who are living uh, and working in this field that aren't even infected and, and right. are doing a fabulous job. Right. And I, I think it's always worthy to remember those. And, and we're all getting older, you know, and I, I think uh, those at the beginning, like yourself, uh, would like to see an end to this disease right. before you retire. Indeed, there was a life that I had before HIV, and I hope that I will have a life after yes. HIV. Right. I was just talking to Carl about that just yeah. a moment ago. Right. Well, thank you so You're much welcome. for being here. Nice it's to very be nice with you. to see you. As always. Yes.